So we're going to go through this a step at a time. I'll show you some of these scripts that I've created. Uh, this is a standard feature in Emiscope, so any of you that own uh, Emiscope can build scripts. So what are they useful for? Any type of repetitive process or uh, so if you have different sets of data that you want to post process in Emiscope and uh, create animations from it or do comparisons, uh, uh, you can do that with, with the uh, scripts and hotkeys. So we'll go through some of that. Let me show you some of these windows here first. Um, over here in the upper left is an acquisition window. Now this is an option to Emiscope, and uh, Emiscope can be connected to a number of different hardware front ends. And uh, boy, okay, there we go. And uh, so this is this is treating Emiscope as the controller of a multi-channel uh, acquisition front end. And uh, you can see down here is a, a, a spreadsheet. We call this our channel spreadsheet. And it's set up here to handle uh, four different acquisition channels. Now, typically, they would be uh, multi-channel front end. When we say multi-channel, we mean that it, it will uh, ac simultaneously acquire data on four channels, which means that the sampling, the filtering, the windowing, anything else that we do to the data is going to be done simultaneously on all four channels. So here you can see in this spreadsheet that there's a, a, an input uh, and it's got a degree of freedom at 15Z. Uh, there's three outputs. Uh, there's some uh, coupling. There's transducer power turned on. So uh, th most of the accelerometers that we use today are uh, and load cells are uh, powered through the acquisition front end. What's called IEPE, or uh, there's other names for it. But here you can see we've got power turned on. We've got an ADC range of voltage. We've got some windowing. Uh, if I go through units, uh, now in this case, there's no transducer sensitivity set up. Those are typically millivolts per unit, engineering unit, or volts, or uh, something like that. In this case, um, I'm actually connected to a data block. So what you're looking at here on the screen are some uh, measurements. And uh, this is data that's already come in from the front end. And we're going to run this as a simulation today. And I'll show you how we do that. So we can take data that's already been pri uh, acquired. Uh, with an acquisition window or uh, imported from uh, a third-party analyzer and we can post process it in this window. So I'm going to show you how we do that with a kind of a simulated acquisition and uh, post processing of some data. So we got four channels of data and this first channel up here is an impulse you can't really see it. It's over here. Uh, let me see if I can just zoom over here a little bit to the uh, to the edge, and we'll take a look at it. Um, okay, so there's the, there's the impulse right there uh, that's coming in, and, and these four traces are time domain data. And then the other three following the impulse are the impulse responses of the uh, a triaxial accelerometer. So we've got here we're set up for 0.1x, and uh, the input is coming in pounds of force from 0.15z, and the outputs are uh, 0.1 and the x, y, and z. So that's very typical four channel. Uh, analyzer setup, and then down below here we're computing an FRF. And how many can we compute with one input and three outputs? We can compute three FRFs. So there they are. There's the three of them that are being acquired or calculated from uh, the time records up here on the top. Now, if I go over here, you can see that I've 
I've set up one of these tabs here to make uh, an FRF or a transfer function measurement. FRF is a special case of a transfer function. Uh, we use the term transfer function in MEScope to refer to any uh, ratio of an output divided by an input. So I can have inputs to whatever. In, in, in mechanical terms, it would be a structure. I have an input and an output. In this case, the input would be the impulse function here. And the outputs would be three of these acceleration responses. And then we can compute coherent, coherence when we have uh, FRFs or transfer functions. Uh, and that is a measure of the linearity between the input and the output. So uh, we're set up to do that. We're going to take two averages. So if I scroll back here, you'll see that there's actually two impulses. Um, boy, I don't see them right now. But we'll start this up and we'll look at it again in a minute. And um, but we're going to do two averages. And uh, oh, well, they're not in here. We've, this is just showing one acquisition, and then we'll have a second one, and we'll average those together, and that's to reduce noise. You can see there's some noise down here on these FRFs. Uh, sampling, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, sample 2,000 samples, and uh, these are the time and frequency parameters. Uh, with MESCOPE, I only need to choose two things here, the number of samples I want to acquire, and uh, the span, which is one half of the sampling rate. So you can see that I've set a span up here of 2,000 hertz, 2 kilohertz. My data down here in the, in the FRF is up to 2 kilohertz. And uh, so the sampling rate would be 4 kilohertz, or twice that. And depending on the front end, well, here this data is coming from a data block. So it was sampled at 4 kilohertz. And these are the other parameters that uh, go along with the time and the frequency data. Uh, triggering, we're going to trigger on the impulse uh, from channel 1. So that's the force channel. And we set up uh, a uh, trigger level at 10% of the peak voltage. So that would be a half a volt in this case because our our uh, peak voltage, I think, is set up to 5 volts, ADC range of 5 volts. And so this data uh, is going to, we're going to trigger here on the input channel. Uh, and then we've got some pre-trigger delay. So this is very typical of most analyzers where <coughs> you, the analyzer is acquiring data continuously. And when the trigger condition occurs, uh, we actually acquire some samples prior to the trigger condition. And in this case, I've got it set for uh, 10 samples. So this is all going to be simulated here um, when we use this window. OK, well, let's go on and look at some of the other windows. Down here is a window of what we call a data block, where we're accumulating the measurements. And by a measurement, I mean, you can see we use the denote uh, the uh, connotation here as I scroll this. It says M, M1, M2, M3. And it's going to go all the way down here to M18. So there's 18 measurements in this data block. And uh, so where do they come from? Well, they come from point 0.1, XYZ, point 0.5, or point 0.3. Let's make this large and take a quick look at it. This is the data that we're going to acquire. Now, this data block already has some data in it, and we're just going to replace that data as we acquire new data. So from point 0.1, point 0.3, point 0.5, point 0.11, point 0.13, and 15. So six different points and triaxial data. Uh, G's per pound, these are FRFs, and there's their units, the measurement type. Uh, this is a cross measurement. It's not an input or an output to the structure. It's actually a cross between the input and output. And these measurement numbers uh, denote the various measurements. So here they are. 
<clears throat> and you can see some of them are very noisy and some of them are very clean. Uh, there's a coherence measurement. Uh, oh no, let me just rescale here. The coherence is not being saved in this data block even though it's being acquired. There's some very clean measurements without any noise and there's some with noise on them. Now when I set up this simulation I, I uh, I use our MIMO capability in Emiscope. We're not going to go through that today, but there I can simply create a data block with some impulses in it and then use mode shapes to uh, simulate the dynamics of the structure and uh, create impulse responses. So that's how that was done. Let me get out of here, go back and put this one back. So when we're connected up to a data block, let me show you the data block of data impulse responses. Here, here, here's, here's the data block of data that we actually are going to acquire uh, from when we run this simulation. So here you can see, let me turn this off, but you can actually see two impulses. There's one at the very beginning of the block we looked at that in the ACK window, so there it is. And then if I scroll over here, um, you can see that there's actually one in the middle of the block and then another impulse response uh, created from that second impulse. So this is a block of data where I would have hit the structure with two hammers. Now this is all simulated. Uh, and I would have gotten two impulse responses and acquired those and saved them in this data block. So you can see over here we've got, in fact, 24 measurements and uh, we've got a, a force input uh, at point 15 in the Z. Now this one denotes a measurement set. Now this is another terminology we use in Emiscope when we collect data together when it's all simultaneously acquired together uh, then uh, we call that measurement set one and then here's another measurement set two and three and four and so forth so we, we're going to test uh, the structure at six different points and each time we acquire data we call that a measurement set so each measurement set has got a, a force input and a triaxial output. And you can see over here the input output now says that the force is the input and the triaxial x, y, and z is the output. Then we go to measurement set two. And so what we're doing here is we're roving the accelerometer and impacting at the same point on the structure. So let me put this down and we'll look at that. We use the structure model itself to indicate where the data is being acquired. And this is the six points on the structure. There's point one with the accelerometer, little icon on the model that we can do this in Emiscope, showing me how to orient the tracks of accelerometer at point one. Uh, to collect the data for measurement set one. Now let me just click on a, a hotkey I've created up here and we'll come back and look at how that works. Uh, I'm going to go to the next point. So each time I press that hotkey, uh, now it shows me where the second location of the tracks or accelerometer should be. And over here in the corner is 15Z that's where I will impact the structure uh, with a, an instrumented hammer and measure its response at point three in the X, Y, and Z. So as I walk through here by pressing this next point, there's point five and that's measurement set three. And you can see that uh, the accelerometer is mounted so that the X, Y, and Z are correct and this is showing me where to impact. So I'd, I would use this project if I wanted to test the Jim Beam and, uh, and we're only going to simulate acquisition of data at 
six different points on the upper plate. And then we're going to use something called shape expansion, which is built into Emiscope, where I can take some FEA shapes that have many more degrees of freedom in them, and I can actually expand the experimental shape data that I, I obtained from these six points. Now, why would we ever want to do that? And also, where would we get an FEA model that would be accurate enough to do this sort of thing? Well, with any simple geometry like this, we'll look at the, we'll look at the mode shapes of the FEA model versus the experimental data that we actually took at all of the different test points, actually 33 of them on the gym beam. And uh, we'll look at those mode shapes. And when we have a good correlation between the FEA and the experimental mode shapes, then we can do something like this where we, let's say we're, we're testing a lot of different gym beams in a production environment, or we simply want to use this for a demonstration, as we're doing here today. Uh, we can take as little as six points on the gym beam and expand those mode shapes using our FEA mode shapes. Uh, which are quite different. They're, they're normal modes, they have no phase in them, but the experimental data does have phases, uh, pretty much normal but complex shapes when, uh, when we take experimental data like this. So there's some differences and yet we can use, uh, we can combine the two very effectively and get some meaningful results. Um, <clears throat> so let me go back here. Uh, this first button here that I've created is called Start Over. Uh, let's look at the mode shapes first, and then we'll come back and, and look at these, uh, these hotkeys and the, the scripting that's behind each of the hotkeys. So what I want to do is just go manually open um, an FEA plate model and uh, So here it is. So this is a model of the FEA plate. And I can go through very easily in Emiscope and solve for its FEA modes, but I've already done that here. So let me just open up. Um, well, let's go back and, and let's do this with them. Let's just minimize all the windows. And then I want to come back here and open up this model and uh, the Jim Beam model, <clears throat> so we'll open that one up too. Um, and let's open up the um, FEA mode shapes. And I have some EMA mode shapes here, but I'm going to create some new ones. Let's just go in, into our original set of FRFs. And, uh, okay, so we're going to curve fit these FRFs very quickly with Jim Beam. It's a, a very easy thing to do. I'll just delete all the curve fit data that's in there. And I have a button up here called Quick Fit. So Quick Fit just builds a mode indicator function, counts the peaks, tells the curve fitter where to and how to curve fit, how many modes, and so these are, this is the original data off the gym beam, and that's one of our demos, so you all that own Emiscope have this, and there's 99 measurements in there, we curve fit them, I'm going to save these shapes into my EMA mode shapes, so I'll just replace those, okay, so let's, uh, let's get out of the curve fitting, I'm going to close this window, do I want to save changes, no, um, okay, so let me arrange windows here and see what I have. Oh, I don't have the, the EMA mode shapes. Okay, there they are. So down below here I've got a, the Jim Beam photo model, and you can see the 33 test points where we collected that data with, a, again, uh, impacting at point 15 with a hammer and roving a triaxo accelerometer. So this is not a roving impact, but a roving accelerometer test, roving response. And we got some mode shapes there. I can start the animation and look at them. So let's, uh, 
let's do that. Um, so I'll start the animation here. And this is my experimental data. And uh, as I click through the mode shapes, you can see, um, you know, the back plate there has got a little bit of funny motion. But those are, those are the experimental data that we got from uh, just curve fitting those FRFs. So 10 mode shapes and all pretty reasonable looking. Uh, up here now I can start an animation of my FEA mode shapes. So let's just do that. Uh, and the first ones are going to be the rigid body modes. Let's see, where am I? Oh, I'm in the wrong. I want to go to my FEA mode shapes. And huh, got some strange looking stuff here. Um, well, let me stop this and go back here and solve for some new modes. Calculate FEA modes. Okay, there's F, there's 80 FEA quad, or these are plate elements. I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, let's use those. And uh, I'm going to save them into my FEA mode shapes table. Replace. Okay, it's going to go through and create some, do some assignments. It's assigned all my measurements, 630 of them, to this model. So let's go ahead and see if this model will now animate. Okay, that's a whole lot better. So the first six modes are rigid body modes. There's our first flexible mode. It's a, it's a bending mode of the back plate. Uh, we don't have one down here uh, in our experimental data. We didn't curve fit for that first mode. Uh, but here's, here's a mode that looks similar to the uh, experimental mode. So let's do this. Let me, let me stop this animation and let's do a comparison real quickly of, of the mode shapes. So I'm going to go say compare shapes. Okay, so I'm going to put this down and say compare or arrange for animation. Uh, so this is showing, and I'm going to make a little room here by drawing that over. This is showing the two uh, models. Now the other thing I can do is I can say I only want to compare shapes that have, okay, it's already set maximum MAC values. So there we are. Those two shapes are 95% alike. Uh, now we're comparing like DUFs. So if I compare the points here, one through five over on this edge, those are the same points on the FEA model. Even though the FEA model's got extra points on it, where I'm matching up the mode shapes to compute the modal assurance criterion or the MAC are at the common points. So as I click through my, my uh, EMA shapes, you can see that they're 95% alike. And now they're out of phase here. I can flip the phase, go through here and animate, compare shapes, flip the right sign. So now they're, now they're animating the same way. So mode shapes, I can always multiply by a minus sign and, and just change the sign uh, so that they animate correctly. Now see here, I need to flip it back. Um, I could either put this command up on my toolbar or I could actually create a hotkey and call that command out of a script, and that would be a lot easier than for going through my mode shapes and comparing them. But you can see the FEA model gave me a pretty good match here. We're at 90% still uh, between the experimental and the FEA data. 89%, um, a rule of thumb is that if they match up 90% or greater, that's a pretty good match. Uh, you can say that we're dropping down here to 82 percent. Let me turn off the. Yeah, we'll even turn 
off. We'll, we'll leave the points on. But here I can overlay them now, and you can see that even at 82 percent, yeah, there's some differences on the bottom plate there. So the top plate they match up pretty well. Bottom plate and the back plate, there's some difference. Now the other thing I can do to make them match up a little bit better is to normalize the experimental data, which has some phase in it. You can see it rolling around a little bit. Okay, I jumped up to 84%. Uh, so still some difference between experiment and analysis at, at this higher frequency. But still you can see a pretty good match between these. So, so what is all this telling us? It's telling us that the experimental modal model and the FEA modal model are pretty accurate uh, in pretty close agreement through the first 10 modes of this Jim Beam structure. So are there errors? Yeah, there's errors in, on both sides. Uh, experimental errors, you can see some of the points moving around a little bit funny over here on the experimental model. Uh, so we maybe got some measurements with some noise in them. And then the FEA model, typically more is better. So we could we could mesh this model here and add some more points and some more elements and maybe it would match up. It would get mode shapes that match up a little more closely. So that's easy to do in MEScope also. But let me just uh, stop this and let's go back and look at the modal test that we were set up to do today and I'm going to clear out everything and so we'll minimize all of our and then I'm going to go push this this start over and so that brings us back and so start over is going to arrange the windows in MEScope that I want to use to uh, demonstrate um, you know a, a modal test in it basically that's what we're I'm going to hold down the control key and click on this hot key start over and let's just take a look at what it's doing um, and this is usually when you start out using these scripts this is the best place to start uh, build a script that um, arranges your windows so that you can kind of see what's going on so here is a script window and you can see that each row in the spreadsheet here, this upper spreadsheet, is called a step. I can select steps just like I can select measurements and select mode shapes and DOFs and anything else in MEScope. I can select them. I can turn off uh, the execution of the step by just saying, no, don't execute this one. Go to the next one. And when I push a hotkey up here, it's going to just essentially go through this script one step at a time and do each of these I got to tell it which window to execute to step in well this first command here the target window is in fact the script window itself so this window is called VSL that stands for vibrant script language arrange windows and that's the name of this window and the command that I'm going to execute is a script command minimize all other windows so what it's going to do is essentially close or minimize it'll turn them into an icon it's going to tear down all the windows that I have in MEScope except the script window which I can look at but let's go on to this next one. Now this next command is going to execute out of the MEScope window itself. So it says uh, PRJ, which is project, uh, denoting essentially the MEScope window. And this one is a command called window position. And then over here I have a description of each of these commands. So Another advantage of a script window is I can put any command in here, or I can put them all in here for a particular window, and read the descriptions of what those commands are going to do. So this one over here, this description says, positions window 
uh, VSL arrange windows from, and then it's given some numbers here. Well, these are percentages and of the screen. Well, where do they get those numbers? It got them right down here because this, this particular command has some parameters associated with it. So you can see that in order to execute this command, I need to give it some parameters. And these are essentially percentages of my work area. Left side, 0 to 1. Well, you can think of that as 0 to 100%. So I'm going to put in here 0 0.02, 0 0.02, right side 0 0.6, 0 0.6. And uh, so if I simply execute that command, and I can do that by um, up here, when I'm in this window, I've got a toolbar up here, and it says script uh, single step. So if I just want to execute that command, I could do a single step. And there it is. It put that window. Uh, where I told it to put the window. And now it's gone to the next step, but let's go back. So this window is positioned at at 2% top and bottom of the left corner, and then 60% of the screen, which is this side over here, of the right and the bottom. So top is at 2%. You can see I've got a little bit of room up here and a little room here. And then the right side and the bottom is essentially this corner here. So that's what that did. Um, let me make this. I'll go back and push. I'm going to hold down the control key and push this. Oh, well, that's as big as it's going to get. So I'll center it and make it larger. You can see how I did that. I, I right clicked to center the script window. And that, that essentially takes up about 80% of it window so I can see what's in here. Okay, the next command is going to set up my impact acquisition window. That's the one that we saw over here on the upper left corner of the screen. The next one is going to be the color gem beam with icons and you can see that's going to be the left side will be half of the screen, the top is zero, the right side is 100% all the way over to the right side and then half to the bottom. So these are position commands and then these two here, this is the uh, be okay, top plate six points. We were looking at that, well we, we did look at some of that data uh, in the data block window and then EMA shapes six points. So if I execute this, now the next one it says uh, go into the acquisition window and connect to a structure. So the acquisition window is connected up to the gym beam with icons, the structure window. And that's because we're going to walk through measurement sets in the acquisition window. And as we do that, uh, it will move to the point locations of the accelerometer and the hammer in each of the six measurement sets. So all this is controlled out of the acquisition window. We already looked at that, but now that you can see where it's being set up here, the acquisition window, as I change measurement sets, it will show on the structure model where to take the next set of data. Okay, here's measurement set number one. So it's, now this is a variable. Where do those come from? See, it's setting variable number one equal to the measurement set, and variable number two is one. So down here is a, this is a command that basically sets one variable equal to another. So this is programming. But where do these variables come from? Well, up here under script, is a command called variables, define global variables. Here it is right here. This is part of scripting where I can have variables. I'm holding down the control key here so I can make this a little larger. I've got some variables in here for this project. One of them is called use hardware. So that's kind of 
programmer would call that a boolean. It's either true or false. In this case, if it's one, that means use the hardware. Uh, we're not going to use the hardware. We're going to simulate. So we're going to set that variable to zero, and that will use the data block. Okay, save FRF position. When we save the FRF data out of the acquisition window into the data block where we're going to curve fit it, that is a position where we want to save the, the three measurements, X, Y, and Z of point 0.1, point 0.5, point whatever. So we'll walk through that measurement set number. We looked at that. And now EMA mode number and FEA mode number, and we'll look at those also because this is how we're going to, we call it curve fitting, but it really is a, an expansion of the EMA data for the six points on the top of the beam so that we can animate mode shapes for all 33 points on the beam. So these are variables that I've set up here that are going to be used. They can be used by any script in this project. So we're going to set the current. Uh, we're going to show DOS. This is a command in the acquisition window that tells it to show the channel DOS. So we looked at the channel DOS in the ACK window. Remember, those were over here uh, in the channel spreadsheet. So whatever measurement set I'm on, uh, those are the DOS that are going to show up over here on the model. Here, let me just push one of this other command here, and you'll see we went to measurement set number two, and now we're showing the channel DOS on the model for point three. So as I click next point, it's actually going to the ACK window and changing the measurement set. We'll get to that one in a minute. Uh, <coughs> point labels, I'm turning off the point labels. So this is saying go to the structure window. This window over here is called the color gym, gym beam with icons. Turn off the point label so we just don't have too much going on there at the same time. Uh, okay, this is clearing out my curve fitting. It's going to open the curve fitting. It says initiate curve fitting, yes. Go into the curve fitting and delete all the data. Now I did that for you when I curve fit the 99 FRS, but now we're just going to curve fit the top plate six point FRS. And then we're going to close that. So that's just going to initialize everything. So if I go back and push this hotkey here, you can see that it went ahead and did all those things that we told it to do. All right, let's go look at the second one, which is really a simple one. I'm going to go to the next point, and I'm holding down the control key. And so this is the script for that hotkey, and here's what it's going to do. Okay, first of all, it's, if, if the gym beam was animating, it's going to say, execute, draw or animate, draw structure. So remember, the in the structure window, I'm either animating shapes or I'm drawing a model. And if I tell it to draw the structure, then it, it stops the animation. And so the window is in the drawing state right now. It's not animating anything. Uh, point labels, again, we're telling it to turn off the point labels. Well, the other script also did the same thing. Measurement set, OK, again, it's telling it to make sure that you show the channel DOS. So this is occurring. We had that command also in the previous script. Next point, now we've got some more scripts. Uh, you might call these programming commands. So what is this command telling me to do? This command is saying, now I can go look at these up here in my script menu. If I go under variables, no, let's see, I want to go, yeah, variables. I can define variables. I can set one variable equal to another. I can do an operation between variables, and I can do some comparisons. So some very simple programming tools for uh, allowing and some logic for 
allowing me to do different things in these scripts. So this one here is going to, um, what is this one doing? This is going to set, it's going to take the variable 2 and add variable 3 to it, which happens to be a 1, and it's going to set that equal to variable 1. So this is programming where I'm picking up something called measurement set number. I'm going to increment it by 1 and then store it back into itself. Now it's going to say if the measurement set, measurement set number is less than number 6, in other words, I've got six measurement sets, and those I created in the acquisition window. Let me show you those again because we, uh, we went through this a little bit quickly. But this is how the acquisition window was set up. This is a little bug in our graphics here that one of the engineers is working on right now. It doesn't always update this, this lower trace data here. But I can, I can press what I've created in here is and if I expand this, maybe you can see a little better here. Active measurements at one of six. So I actually had to go up here under measurement sets in the ACK window and uh, add measurement sets. I had to create six of them. And these are all saved with the acquisition window. And if I just press some keyboard keys here, F5 and F6, Watch over here, it will actually walk through. See it now is measurement set number two. The graphics changes, everything I've set in here for, uh, and now it's measurement set three and 11, uh, number four. As you can see, that's going to go to point 11. Five is point 13, and then six. So this will just go around in a circle. Um, so this is showing the measurement sets that have been set up in the ACK window. And this is standard stuff in our acquisition window, so I can set up a whole test before I ever go uh, and take data. So let me go back here, and where were we? We were in the, the next point. We were looking at some of its logic here. So it says if, if it's greater than or if it's less than or equal to 6, then go to the continue. And what it does is it actually sets the current set, measurement sets, current set equal to the global variable called measurement set number. If it's not less than 6, it's going to reset measurement set number to 1. So if I execute this, what it's going to do let me put this over here. You can kind of see it executing. It goes pretty fast. Uh, let me shrink this down a little bit. And what it's doing, you can see that it's it's changing the picture over here so that it's showing me where to take the next set of data on this on this model. Okay. Well, let's. Let's go through and run this. And this next key here is very similar. It says previous point. So that's just going to work in reverse. And then when it gets down to point one, it's going to jump back to point uh, 15. The next one here, it says acquire data. Let's take a quick look at that, that script. Again, not very many lines in here, but it's going to instruct uh, I'm going to click in here and hold down the control and make this a little bigger. Um, so what's this going to do? Okay, well, it's going to center the acquisition window. So I've been using that command with a right-click menu. Active graph is the lower graph. So remember, there's two graphs in the acquisition window. Upper is the time records. Lower is the calculated, in this case, the FRFs. Um, we're going to overlay by DOF. Now, this is so we can look at coherence versus FRF. Uh, our coherences are essentially one with this nice clean data. Uh, again, we're going to say uh, color gem beam. Now, this is the other gem beam model that we were animating the 
the comparison at them. So I want to make sure that that's not animating anymore in case I was doing a comparison between the FEA and the EMA. Acquire front end scope data. Now, where is it? This is the scope command, so it's simply going to acquire data from where? Well, out of the data block. Um, I didn't show you that, but I actually connected the acquisition window up to the data block with a command. Uh, I think that was in the start over. Uh, let's, let's just keep going here. Now here is another command that's actually coming out of this window itself, acquire data. And it's a script, it's a question box. So this is one where you can have your own messages come up to tell you what to do. Now this one here has a yes and no button in it, so uh, if I click on the yes button, it's going to acquire. If I click on the no button, it's going to stop. Uh, and we'll run that in a minute, and you'll see. I can change the size of the text and the color of the text and some other things. Now here's the acquire start. So this is where I'm going to actually acquire data. Uh, and I'm going to wait for the trigger. So if I was set up and hooked up to hardware, I would actually be uh, impacting the Jim Beam with a hammer, acquiring data, and, uh, and, and processing that. OK, so then now I put up another box that says the measurement's complete. Uh, press yes to save, no to repeat. So a similar kind of a dialogue. Uh, and now we're going to run another script. See, this says script run once. And this one here is a save FRFs. So let's just go take a quick look at that. Uh, these are like subroutines, but one script can call another. So I have one over here called save FRFs. So here is the script that's going to save the FRFs. Uh, let me just walk through that. It's going to select measurements in the acquisition window. Uh, it's going to select one through three. Um, the coherence comes after one through three. So those are just the FRFs. Um, <clears throat> okay, save FRF position. See, we're going to going to do a little math here to figure out where to save these measurements. Since we're saving three of them, we're going to take the measurement set number, multiply it by three, then this next one is going to subtract two. So for example, if I'm on measurement set one, I'm going to point at location three minus two. I'm going to point at measurement set one in my data block of FRS, top plate, six points. So there it is, save in that position, I'm going to select that measurement and save an FRF. Uh, oh, this is going to increment it by one, so there I'm going to, oh, I'm simply selecting. So it's just selecting, selecting, selecting. Now down here, it saves the measurements out of the acquisition window into the data block. So let's just run this. You, you get the idea here. I'm going to go back and start over. And I'm going to go to measurement number one. So I can go to any measurement I want. I can start there. And I'll press the go button. And here it is. Says, so it's in the scope mode. And it's uh, waiting for a trigger. So it says, press yes to acquire, no to stop. So if I'm all set up to impact the structure, I would go ahead and, and do that. And now it's triggering out of, it did the two averages. It actually triggered twice, and it's done. And down here below is the measurement that it made from the data in the data block. So I'll go ahead and, and save. And so now you can see down here it's actually selected. Those are the three measurements that it's selected and it's saved them in there. Let's try another one. I'm going to go to the next point now and do the same thing. Uh, 
I pressed the wrong button. So no, let's go back here. I want to go to the next point. So there's point number three. And now I press the go button. And it says, go ahead, let's acquire. And it's triggering. It's collecting the data. And now it's triggered again. It's collected the data. And it says, do you want to save? So you can see here that it saved the second set of measurements for point three. Now I can go through and save them all, but I've already got data in here. So let's just go ahead and do the next step. And that is uh, right here, curve fit. So I'm going to curve fit those measurements. And I can do this anytime I want, and it will curve fit. And here is just doing a quick fit of my six measurements. And you can see. Uh, that it's done that. And also, it's saved my measurements away, uh, my mode shapes away for those 10 modes, and my six measurement points. So I only have data for the top plate. Now, I could animate that, but it wouldn't look very good, because it, all I would see is those six points moving around on the top plate. Now, in MEScope, we can use what we call geometric interpolation. And geometric interpolation, I need to set that up. I need to assign my six measurement point data to all the other points on the structure. And they will also animate, too. Um, and we used to call those measurement equations. We got rid of that term equations. And now we just call it assigning. Uh, measurements to the unmeasured points. In this case, all of the points on the structure, uh, other than those six points, are unmeasured. But since we've already seen that we have some pretty good match of FEA shapes to the EMA shapes, I'm going to go over here and press Animate and watch what happens down here in the shape table. We're going to replace those, those six measurements with, oh wow, I got some strange looking results here. <clears throat> so let me just stop that and, uh, and go in here and I oh, didn't want this either. I'm getting all sorts of strange stuff. Let me go back here and stop the animation. Well, let me stop it in here. And I'm going to go and reassign my measurements to the gym beam with icons. OK, those mode shapes. Let's just see how well they animate now. No. OK, well, I, I got mode shapes, but I need to interpolate also. Uh, let's go do that. Well, I, I've got some strange results here, for sure. Um, let me just wrap up because my assignment got a little mixed up between the FEA and the, and the experimental data. Um, we have a couple of questions, Mark. Yeah, we do. The first question we have is regarding the uh, direction of the uh, hammer impact. Uh, is the hammer impacting in the upwards direction, 15Z positive? <coughs> or the downwards direction, 15z negative? The answer there is that <clears throat> the direction of the hammer doesn't matter when I'm doing mod modal testing like this. Now, if I wanted to be uh, precisely correct, uh, of course, it's going down. And this one indicates that it's going up here, which is kind of strange because it would be a little difficult. I mean, I could hit on the bottom of this plate. It doesn't matter. So let me say that again. The direction of our reference 
never matters. If I had a shaker on here, in this case I'm hitting with a hammer, uh, even if I was doing operating mode shapes where I'm just using one of these accelerometers as a reference, in order to get mode shapes, the reference is just used to get phase between, in this case would be between input and output. Uh, if it was just a reference accelerometer, I'm just getting phase between that reference and all my roving. In this case, I have six roving accelerometer locations. The reference does not matter. Now, let me even go further and say the direction, and the question was, is the direction wrong here? Is it supposed to be down instead of up? That would not change any of my results, none of them whatsoever. It would all come out exactly the same. I'd get the same mode shapes. As we saw when we flipped the sign of the FEA mode shape versus the experimental, uh, the animation just flips, but the MAC values don't change. MAC is insensitive to the sign. It's only looking at whether or not those two shapes are collinear. In other words, do they lie on the same straight line or not? Uh, so, again, let me say it again, the reference point doesn't matter, the direction doesn't matter. So if I were to hook a shaker up to this structure, I could mount that shaker at any oblique angle, any angle I want, in any direction I want. I could take a set of data like this with a roving accelerometer and I would get valid results. Second question, Mark? All right. Uh, second question has to do with damping. Uh, if you had set damping in the FEA modes, would we see better agreement? I see the damping ranges uh, from 0.44 to 2.9. <clears throat> no. And, and what I showed you here, and, and I made a mistake somewhere, and I'm not sure where. Um, let me just uh, go back and, and we'll look at the... Experimental data always has damping in it. So here's our expanded experimental data. So the frequency and the damping of the modes is retained. The mode shapes, you can see, have phases in them. And uh, well, this is our 15, or our 16 points here, where we, where we actually tested the data. The when we do that shape expansion or the comparison of the shapes, uh, frequencies don't matter, damping doesn't matter. We're just using the shapes. So when we expand the experimental data with the FEA data, we're just using shapes again. And as I mentioned, it's a curve fit of the FEA shapes to the experimental shape data. Very simple, linear equations, linear analysis, at least squared fit. Uh, that that is a command in the shape table called uh, shape expansion. Here it is right here, shape expansion. If I execute that command, uh, I can just do that manually. Uh, and then I can select my FEA shapes. Now, those are normal shapes. So when we curve fit them, we actually curve fit them with a complex uh, um, scale factor, or uh, actually called modal participation. It's the participation of each FEA shape in each EMA shape. That's what we did when I ran through that animation there, but my equations are kind of messed up. Uh, FEA shapes you want to unselect, and so let's just save these back into the EMA shape table and replace. <clears throat> okay, what happened? I didn't, I didn't refresh this. Yeah, let me just open that up again and EMA shapes, and I'll make it large. So damping with the EMA, uh, FEA shapes would never have damping. Uh, you can see that I got a whole bunch of additional stuff here. Oh, here's here's why it didn't animate. I've got uh, the FEA shapes actually expanded the EMA with some rotations because they had rotations in them. So that's why it wasn't animating correctly. I can delete those and then 
we should be able to animate. How would I do that? Um, let's select. We're kind of running over here, Mark. Let me just wrap this up. I can see why things didn't animate. But again, to answer the question, you can see that these um, these shapes now they do have uh, they're normalized. However, in general, they would not be normalized. I think maybe I have oh I have it set to normal. So there they are. There's the expanded EMA, uh, FEA or EMA shapes expanded from the FEA, and they have uh, they have phases in them because the original six points that I tested had, had phases. Anyway, there's the reason we've got rotations in here. So FEA models can give us information that we normally wouldn't even measure experimentally. Uh, we could use these mode shapes to do SDM work uh, where we could actually put rotational stiffnesses uh, into a, a model and, uh, and simulate um, the rotational stiffness, the translational stiffness using experimental, expanded experimental data like this. Okay, are we done, Mark? Yep, that's it for the question. All right, well, I want to thank you all, um, and uh, hopefully you learned something about MBScope and how we can program things with scripting and hotkeys and variables and uh, we can do these simple tasks uh, in a more automated way. Uh, thank you for attending, and next month we'll have another uh, one-hour session together showing you some more of the, the features in MEScope.